My name is John Lee, and I'm the author of The Flying Boy, Healing the Wounded Man. Uh, the book has uh, been out for about two years, and a number of men and women seem to relate to the book. It's uh, more, obviously, more than a story about myself and my own journey uh, into recovery from uh, being a flying boy. But now, thank God, I get to go around the country, and people will say, Oh, I'm a flying boy, you know, or women will come up and say, I'm a flying girl. And that makes me feel real good because the phrase is getting sort of popular enough to get out into the, in the general culture. But a lot of people wonder what a flying boy or what a flying girl is and, and what the state of relationships are today and what's happening with men and why men are always so unavailable in relationships. Um, I doubt you women came to hear the answer to those questions, but, but I'll try to give them to you anyway. Just sit through it, and maybe you know, you'll, you'll have to grit your teeth and bear uh, finding out why the men you love don't seem to be able to commit and, and be intimate. One of the main things that I've seen is over the years of studying psychology and psychiatry is that there's been a tremendous emphasis on um, how to make relationships work without really looking at the man's side of it. You know, you have to understand that modern psychology was built on and founded on understanding feminine psychology. Freud's patients were women. Uh, even the, the national average now is seven out of ten clients are women. And so we have a good deal of information about the uh, feminine psyche, don't we, guys? <laughs> I mean, they say that in lectures, and there's lots of books out there, but I do know that a lot of men are still scratching their heads going, you know, you, know, you tend to see this a lot. They just say this one word, and men will say, women. <laughs> and then they sort of shake their head. And, and women are sitting over in the other corner of the restaurant going, men. You know, and we can't seem to ever get it. But there is a lot of information out on women and what's going on with them these days. There's even a lot of information out on men, but most of it's being written by women. You know, and saying this is this is what's going on with men. And I go, how do you know? You know, and how do you really know what's going on with us? Well, in the meantime, I've been doing men's groups in Austin, and I've opened the Austin Men's Center there. And we've been, I've been doing workshops around the country for men and helping uh, set up men's groups. So we've been finding out. Let me tell you, one of the things that's going on with men today is, is that men are actively seeking to heal themselves in virtually all parts of this country. And I've gotten letters so far from England, Canada, and Mexico that says we have flying boys here as well and we want to read your book and do something about it even if we have to fly across the ocean to get it because it is hard to get. So, this, but so men are working on themselves more than ever before. There's a national men's movement going on now. It's, it's uh, kind of the same place that the women's movement was 25 years ago. And, you know, we are a little slow to catch on, but, but we do get there by and by. Women have been telling us men, why don't y'all get together, you know, and talk and, and, and share with each other. You know why men don't get together and talk? It's because men are afraid of men. Men are very afraid of men. I'm even talking about the men who are conscious, healthy uh, reading men. By and large, men are afraid of men. And what women don't understand is why would that be so? Because we as women are not that afraid of other women. Why are we also afraid of each other? The answer may lie in the fact that us men, most of us, were scared to death of our fathers. Just absolutely scared to death. Or, if not scared to death outright, we didn't have any fathers there to be scared of. They were gone. Where were they? Work, alcohol, more work, dead, emotionally dead, spiritually dead, but they would 
put clothes on her back, food in her stomach, and send us to college and hope that we would have a better life than they did. Only to end up with a life in spite of ourselves and in spite of them very much like the life that they lived. You see, you want to know one reason why men cannot commit to you women? It's because men do not have a model for what that would look like except one. One model. Mom and dad. Most men long for tenderness, long for gentleness, long for affection and to give and receive equally. But most men were raised in a culture that said, this is not what men do. My dad held my sister's baby like this, arms extended, and his hands were shaking as she placed that infant in his hands. And he looked at my mother and he said, and he called my mother, mother. That's another thing we'll talk about in just a minute. He handed the baby immediately to my mother and said, Mother, take him. I'll drop him. And I, saw, I looked at that and I thought, my God, no wonder I always felt so disconnected from my dad. He probably never held me. And from that day on, well, not even back before that, he wasn't there when I was being born. Where was he? My dad was celebrating my birth at work and at the bar afterwards. Totally disconnected. Totally separate. And he, believe it or not, was the only man around as a child that I had to model after. He carried that on up through the hard years, the early years, the childhood years through adolescence. And you see that my dad was not much more, bless his heart, than a vacant lot. And to get parented by a vacant lot and shown how to be in relationship by a vacant lot and a codependent mother who was as hooked into his alcoholism as he was, you don't have a lot to go on, but what you do have, what you do have is this little voice inside of you that says, I'll never be like that. I'll do anything I have to do, but damn it, I'll never be like that. He was emotionally unavailable, spiritually unavailable, and I said I would never be like that. He didn't know how to deal with his anger. He didn't know how to deal with his fear, and I said I'd never be like that. And you know what? You know what? I was just like that. I didn't know a feeling from anything. Anger, I was as angry as my dad was. But because I went to college, and I got a little bit of knowledge, and then I started, you added that with meditation, and you had that with alcohol, which I swear I would never do. You know, I could look like I was not my dad. You know what I mean? I could look like I wasn't him because my dad was this rough uh, construction, outdoors, factory kind of guy. Well, not me, boy. I read poetry. And I got an education and I became a professor. I tried, men try real hard to become everything that their fathers weren't so as not to be like them, and at the same time to do so well in life that dad will finally say, yeah, that's my boy. You're doing good, son. I love you. Men work themselves silly, still trying to get that from their dads, and trying so hard not to be like their dads. Now, the dads get a bad rap because their dads did the same thing to them. We're stopping it now. Many of us are stopping it now. But we have to know what's going on and what went on before we can stop and, and turn around and do something new. And one of the things that I know is, is that women have to understand. They have to understand what's going on in the male psyche. 
that have to come to terms with what it is that we're about and listen to our stories. You see, I would get with women, and they would say things like, just open up. Just open up and come from your heart. I'd go, where is that? Where is that? My boots? Where is my heart? I don't have a body. I've got from here up, my neck up. That's what I've got. Because if I go from the neck down, what I've got is pain. Lots and lots and lots of pain. Right here in this body. So if you give me enough alcohol, you give me enough work, you give me enough sex, you give me enough nicotine, and I don't have to feel this pain in this body. But when a woman would turn to me and say, just open up and let me hear. Just speak from your heart. That was also, that was one of the things I hated as much as when, some, when somebody, man or a woman, they would say, flying boys, i got to tell you, are notoriously intense. Very intense people. Most men, they'd say things like, John, man, you need to lighten up. I go, how do you lighten up? People keep telling me that. How do you lighten up? And they just stop saying it. They say, see what I mean? Right there. That's what I'm talking about. Lighten up. And I'd go, oh, man. That and that and the other thing I hated the most would be after a trip home. I always try to put off taking my girlfriend home as long as possible. Because once I did, I was always sure to hear this one phrase that would almost bring out the killer in me. Two weeks later, after a visit home for Christmas, I'd hear this phrase. You know who you remind me of? I go, don't say it. Don't you say it. She go, but you know. <laughs> you know who you remind me of. Yeah, I remind you of my dad. I remind you of my dad. Why? Because I'm my father's son. As much education as I got, as much poetry as I read, as much meditation as I did, I was still my father's son. Now, you guys know, if you guys, the guys that are over 30, you know that every year that goes by, you begin to walk like them a little more. <laughs> you begin to sound like them a little more. You begin to dress like them a little more. And you go, you know, when I was 15 or 20, I, I'd do just the opposite. I'd go my hair down to my back, you know, so I wouldn't be like my dad. But now, I go walking down the road, and I say something, something comes out of my mouth, and I go, where's dad? <laughs> you know, I, I realize, you know. Now, there's a part of that that I'm, I'm lucky enough to be in, not long in my recovery enough to be able to embrace and cherish. But there's also a part of that that I had to treat as a woundedness as a deep woundedness. The only thing that had to be treated as a deep woundedness about the father and son deal before a relationship with a woman can be had <clears throat> is just how much it hurt, just how much it hurt for a boy to grow up without his father. To grow up without his father. You see, Robert Bly, a teacher of mine, once said, and he quoted a German psychiatrist, it's a, it's a phrase that we use here in the codependency and ACA circles, but the psychiatrist back in the um, early 1900s said, where the father is not, there develops a hole in the sun. There develops a hole in the sun. I don't know about you guys, but I know I had one because my father wasn't there and there was this big, gaping hole that I had to try to fill with something that the father was supposed to fill. You know, as a child, we came uh, ideally to be equipped with masculine energy, feminine energy, i.e. a mother and a dad. But after the Industrial Revolution, the father wasn't around much. He had to work. He had to make money. Before the Industrial Revolution, most dads were there. Did you know that? My, even, even during the time of my grandfather's life, my dad had a dysfunctional relationship with his father, but he was there. Do you understand what I mean? My dad could smell his dad, see his dad, hear his dad, because he was out in the barn. You know, or he was out in the field. And most of the time, he was there with him. I grew up going, where's Dad? Well, he's down at the factory. Some men go, where's Dad? Well, he's at the office. Well, what does he do at the office? 
Well, you have to let him tell you, but I never see him. You gotta have to tell me, Ma. He's always gone. He gets up before I get up for breakfast, and he doesn't come in until after I go to bed. And that hole keeps increasing. And you know what that hole does? That every vacuum needs to be filled. Every hole longs to have something put in it. And so what men would do then would be, do the best they could, or little boys would do the best they could, and that would be they turn to their mom. They would turn to their mom. And you know what? My mom had a hole too. My mom had a hole. There was not masculine male energy coming to her life from dad, so she had a hole. So she turned to me to fill that hole, to be a surrogate husband. Now listen, women, if you know a man, if you've been with a man who has had to be a parent to a parent or a surrogate husband to a mom, You've got to understand that we do not have a good background for being in relationships. Indeed, on one level, we loved our moms, still do, but on another level, we knew that they were doing something wrong with us, but we'd already lost part of our support system, dad to the factory or to the office, and we weren't there going to lose this other part or else we would die. That's one reason why men are so scared when women leave them. They're afraid, that little boy inside is afraid that they're going to die. Now you women might look at that too and see the same thing in you, that once we leave you, men leave you, you think, God, that little girl, who's going to be, who's going to be there for me? Who's going to take care of me? Who's going to nurture me? So it's real hard for men and women to get together with that as the foundation. Now there's, ex there's um, exemptions to this rule here, but where the father was not, the mother very often was there too much. Was very often there too much for her own neediness, and because I had to learn how to feel, how to deal with life, not through dad. My dad was in charge of fixing things that had motors attached to them, okay? My mom was in charge of feelings and emotions. So if I wanted to know how to fix an Evan Rude, I could go to dad, but if I wanted to deal with the feeling side of my life, the emotional side of my life, I had to go to mom, but guess what? At 10 or 12 or 13, that's beginning to break down. Because a lot of what I'm feeling and going through is about the same thing that mom's got, which is memory glands. Right? So you at 13, little boys don't go to their moms and say, look, uh, something's happening here and I don't know what it is, but I tried to talk to dad about it. He said if it's got a motor attached to it, he can handle it. <laughs> I said, well, I think it does. It does get wound up and cranked up sometimes and feels like the engine's running it. So, but then he wouldn't know what I was talking about. So, and then I, he said, go talk to your mom. Yeah. And I go, oh, no, man, I can't do that. You know, I think it's something to do with the problem of women anyway, you know. So we have a real, real hard background to come to women with and hear them say, open up. Open up. Speak from your heart. Tell me how you feel. I go, you know, they ain't got a motor on it. I don't know no, I can help you. Okay? Speak from your body. You see, the other thing women and men, men, you already know this, if, and, and women, you probably do too, but little boys got shut off from their bodies at an early age. Those of us growing up in our culture really did. You women did too. You women did too. But there was something around puberty and adolescence that kept pulling you back to your bodies, thank God. But for us, we had to keep ascending away from our bodies because we were taught... So many crazy things, but one of them was, and you are too as women, but that the body is evil. You grew up in a, in a moderately Christian home in the United States in the 30s, 40s, or 50s. You know that the predominant theology from the early 18th century was deny the body, 
with it into subjection, but for God's sakes, don't take pleasure in it. Don't take pleasure in it. So that by the time we were five or six, we had already had the hell shamed out of us about our bodies. Boys and girls. So you take that and you put it on top of how boys were treated emotionally by fathers and the culture at large. And you got a problem. And here's the way that went. The boy that could hold in the most emotions got to be captain of the football team. If you couldn't hold them in, you were labeled a sissy or worse. You see? If you couldn't hold those feelings in, you were branded. We do not want the pansy playing on our team. Because if he gets hit hard, he goes out and cries. You know? And if he cries, that'll make us all look bad. So today you look at the corporate heads, or even some of the folks in our movement, and you see them able to heap on their shoulders tremendous amount of pressure and pain and never grumble. Never utter a word. Just pile more on there. I can do it. Hell, I'm a man. Hadn't felt my body in 35 years anyway, so just pile up there. Oh, well, you, you in some pain too? Well, hop up there too. I can carry you. I can carry you. I can carry my children. I can carry my work. I can carry everything and stuff it inside me and then be totally cut off from my feelings and my emotional life, except at the rarest occasion. The rarest occasion. Very often, the only time that I could feel anything was when it was intense. You know that one? If it was intense enough, it might get in there. So I would keep my life so jazzed up that there would always be drama and intensity going on because if it wasn't, I would feel bored. And I wouldn't feel anything at all. Do you ever have that? You know what I mean? But as long as I kept that going, then I could feel something. Now I want to tell you something. A lot of men are doing a lot of work, but they're still doing it from the neck up. They don't do it with their bodies. They don't feel it in their bodies. That's the only thing that I have a major problem with in, in a lot of modern psychotherapy, is, in traditional psychotherapy, is that the body has been left out of the process. You know, it, it's, <clears throat> it's just been omitted. Look back at our culture and you understand why. You know, most of the people who have been doing the omitting have flown up into their head. See, that's the thing about the flying boy. The flying boy flies up into his head. He flies off into fantasy. He flies away from relationships. He flies away from commitments. He can't ever seem to quite get those projects done. But he's always in flight from one thing or another or one woman or another. And he flies two other women, two other projects, and he starts them all over again. There's a lot of drama in that. Isn't there a lot of drama and intensity in those new relationships, in those new projects? And if that won't get you buzzed, I don't know what will. That's, why, that's been one of the biggest barriers to recovery for all the codependents and adult children that I've worked with over the years is when they start getting into recovery, their relationships get boring. And so I hear these people all the time, they'll say, I'll say, Did you, do you ever see anybody at an Al-Anon meeting that you really are attracted to? No. They make great friends. They make really good friends, all the Al-Anon people. Women say this about men, men say this about women. But I never see anybody I'm really attracted to. You, have, you ever heard this syndrome of it? I don't know why that is. There's, there's 60 people at our Sunday Coda meeting, and, and out of that 60 people, there's lots of women there, and there's lots of men there. And you say, well, don't you find any of these people attractive? No, they're too healthy. <laughs> too healthy. No drama in this, no intensity in that. Hell, I won't feel a thing if I get hooked up with her. You know, all, all, all we'll do is just be happy. You know? It'll be too smooth. You know, and that, oh, God. You know, what would I do with that? I grew up in hell. You know, I can't be dating somebody where I'll be happy. 
You know, and start that. You know, I need the jazz. I need the excitement. I need the juice because if I don't have it, I won't feel much. I just won't feel much. And we grew up in such intense uh, situations and circumstances that, you know, we really, we really thrive on that intensity and that darkness and that pain and that powerlessness. You know, and many of us still have this notion of, is, of well, I'll lose this person I love and then I'll be real creative for a while. You, know, you ever have that notion crammed in your head? So I don't know where that one came from. The suffering artist syndrome, I call it, for adult children. Is they love to have intense, dramatic relationships and then do what I do with them and that's turn them into a book after they're over. Right? It works real well. And I got a movie deal out of it and everything. So somebody the other day said, you know, um, there's this real nice woman I want you to meet. And I go, well, I'm, I'm working on another book. I, you know, if I, if I meet her now, you know, I won't be able to finish my creative work. So, so I, I decided to turn that around and met her anyway, and I still finished the book. The drama and the intensity and the darkness and the lack of feeling from the neck down, the neck down, is real important. i got to tell you, part of my recovery has been and the work that I've been doing over the years has been in emphasizing the body, the feelings, what's going on in the shoulders, the back, the buttocks, the legs, the feet, the stomach. Uh, I'm doing training therapy, uh, training sessions for therapists now around the country trying to teach folks how to become aware of the body in greater and greater ways, deeper and deeper ways, because the body will tell us when we're in codependency. And when we're not. But everybody's so cut off from it that no one really knows. They go, am I not being be codependent now? Well, if you had the, your stomach back and you felt that twist of a knot, you know, you would know. Do you know what I'm talking about? But men don't have their bodies. Here's another reason, ladies and men, why we didn't. Why I didn't have my body, and I, I'm lucky to say now I, I, I'm in it a lot. The one reason why we didn't have it is because this body got abused, got severely abused. And abuse can only be compensated with disassociation and diminution of that pain, right? A dismissal of the pain. See, a lot of the men sitting in this room right now got hurt physically a lot as children. How many of you got a whipping as a boy with a belt or a switch? Nearly every man in here, nearly every man in here, you know what that will do to the body? You know what that alone will do to the body? It will freeze it up. Because when a kid is being switched or paddled or hit with a broom or, or hit with a fist, or hit with a coat hanger, the body stops breathing, and it goes, <gasps> and it stops, and it tenses everything in the body. You know, you don't see kids getting beaten going, yeah, I'm breathing, just keep hitting me. You know, you don't see that. You see them tense up, tighten up every muscle in their body, and they go like that, and they go, okay, I can get through this. I can get through this. I can do it. And they can. We did. That's how we got here. We got through it. But in the process, enough of that caused us essentially to be walking around like this, always unsure when the next blow, emotional blow, physical blow, was coming. Now, you women got that, too. Many of you women got that. But nearly every man in here raised their hand and said, I got that. Now, something that a lot of people don't understand, though, is, is that bodies freeze up and armor up like that when somebody rejects them, ridicules them, criticizes them, demeans them, or demoralizes them. The body stops breathing and holds it in and waits until it's over. So it seems like so many adult children that I work with are kind of in that position of like, wait until it's over. You know, just kind of gritting their teeth and waiting until it's all over. 
Wait until the fun begins. And the hurt stops. But adult children who grew up in dysfunctional families keep perpetuating the hurt over and over and over again. And it doesn't ever seem to stop. Because they keep recreating the relationships that they had with their mothers. But most importantly, women, and this is something you need to be aware of, you men too. Most importantly, men will keep creating relationships with women that remind them at a very deep unconscious level of their fathers. Of their fathers. And men go, wow, is that true? Well, you can think about it and make your own list. I ask people at workshops all the time, I go, write down all the ways that your last girlfriend or wife reminds you of your mom. And they go, oh, that's easy. It's this way, this way, and this way. I say, now make a list of the ways that she reminds you of your dad. And they go, my dad? Why, she doesn't remind you. She's this way and, and this way. and She's this way and this way and this way. Very often for life. So those more of us who are more educated and sophisticated, we just go out and find an opposite partner that will remind us of both of them a lot of the time so that we can work on our stuff and get through it much more quickly. But if we don't do that, see how many of you have gone out, you men, see how many of you have gone out and got with a woman who was like your mom? Let that play out for about three or four years, learn what you could learn from that. And then the next woman... She wasn't like that at all. She was at 180 degrees opposite. And lo and behold, it'll probably be like your dad. And then you go, oh, this ain't too cool either. I left my dad at 17, so I need to go find somebody else. And you see, one of the things that happens to men particularly is they go out and they recreate those relationships looking for the mom and the dad, looking for the love. You see, there's a thing about us if you remind me at a very deep unconscious level about my dad and I can get you fixed or changed or get you to love me, you know what that's like? That's almost like getting my dad to do it. It's not exactly the same, but in the psyche it's real close and it's real satisfying. That's where so much codependency comes in in counselors' situation. We can't, we couldn't fix our family, right? So by God, we'll just take on Texas. <laughs> you know, I can never, I said, also codependents and adult children are kind of retarded like their dads in some ways. You know? It's like I'm, I, I couldn't fix everybody in Alabama, so I moved to Texas. You know? like I should have moved, if I'd been smart, I'd moved up to Rhode Island or something. I moved to Texas. And I realized I started looking at that thinking and I got that from my dad because it, my dad was kind of retarded in those ways. <clears throat> he especially was retarded in the areas where he would say things like one of my favorite um, retarded phrases of his was when he'd be beating the shit out of me, he'd be saying things like, stand still, stand still. <laughs> you know, and I'd go, you crazy. <laughs> stand still, you know. I mean, I'd say, well, how weird are you? And then the other favorite phrase, you know, he'd say, he would always say, you know, this is hurting me more than it's hurting you. And I'd go, God, you are, you got the IQ of dirt. How can you be saying this? This is hurting you more than it is me. Um, and there, there's a couple of other favorite ones, but uh, the other one, you know, the, the other one was, uh, he'd just do something or beat the crap out of me or something, you know, and he'd say, um, oh, stop crying, stop crying. If you don't stop crying, I'm going to give you something to cry about. I go, what did you just do it? Stop, please, get me off this train. You know, this is just going crazy. So, we got all that abuse in our background. That freezes up the body. That keeps those feelings frozen in there. And then we get with somebody who says, thaw out, thaw out, open up, tell me who you really are, tell me what you really feel.